I don't know if I'd call this a very obedient congregation or just used to kind of the, the Baptist routine. The pastor gets up and everybody sits down, so I don't even have to tell you guys. To, you may be seated. It simplifies my job considerably. So, again, it's good to see everybody this morning. It's been eight weeks, and now we come to the conclusion of this series. I remember growing up when, um, as a kid, being the son of a timber faller, somebody working in the timber industry, if you recall what that looked like in the 80s, there was a lot of instability with regard to the timber industry, and so there were times when Dad's employment was subject to the whims of the weather, physical and political. Winds would come about that would put Dad out of work, leaving our family without much income. So, one of the things that we did not have, at least until I was probably in middle school, I guess, was a television. So, not having a television typically meant frequent trips to the library. And so I became a bit of a reader. I'm not as much any, anymore, not as much now as I used to be. But I became a bit of a reader and I always liked books. I would read a book and sometimes I'd get a little bored with the book and I'd have to jump to the end of it. So I kind of gravitated towards these books. How many remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books growing up? I liked those because it had a common starting point, but then you'd come to the end of the chapter and it would give you a couple of choices and then you'd turn to that particular chapter to carry on the story. And you could read a book two or three times and wind up with two or three different endings to the story. So you kind of had an opportunity to decide for yourself where you wanted to go with the story. Well, sometimes we treat our lives as if it's like a choose your own adventure book. For us, the starting point is when we are born and depending on the decisions we make, we get to choose our own ending. We get to choose how our ending would be. However, the Bible communicates to us a very different story. We are not the writers of our stories. We are but characters in a larger narrative that is called the gospel. The author of the story is also the protagonist in the story. In this grand epic, the subject of the story is our triune and omnipotent God. He created all things from the beginning, and he created them to be good. This relationship was reflected in how mankind related to one another and to creation as a whole. However, through temptation and deceit, with the help of the serpent, sin entered the world, and as a result, humanity came under the judgment of God. Death and disfellowship were the result, and rather than harmony, man came into conflict with God and with one another. We saw all of this in Genesis chapters one through three. Through the prophet Isaiah, we saw that humanity could no longer stand before a holy God. Just a glimpse of God's unveiled holiness would magnify our own sinfulness to the point that we would call down curses on ourselves and perhaps bring us to the point of repentance. Yet through Isaiah, we also saw that this same holy God prepares a way for people to be redeemed through the most unlikely of saviors. He would be completely sinless, and yet he would willingly die 
in the place of those who deserved judgment in order to redeem them from their sins. In Romans, we saw that this redemption begins with a point in time declaration of justification. And this declaration is not just simply a wiping of the slate. It is something that cannot be earned by our own efforts. It's Christ's righteousness in place of ours. And it is received not by works, but by faith. And hence, Jesus Christ, whose righteousness becomes ours, is this unlikely savior that Isaiah talks about. So as we are declared to be just, we begin this process of transformation into what we have already been declared to be. This process that we call sanctification. And that brings us to the final chapter in this story. So how does the story end? Is it possible for us to jump to the back of the book like I did as a kid, find out how the story wrapped up. How do things turn out? Thankfully, we can have the answer to that question. We know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. So turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Revelation. We're gonna see how this story turns out. Beginning in Revelation, we're going to, I'm going to read passages from, from Revelation 20, 21, and 22. So, turn with me in Revelation, in your Bibles, to the back of the book. Should be, even if you don't know your books of the Bible, it should be one of the easier ones to find. Revelation chapter 21, beginning in I'm going to make sure I get this right, beginning in verse 11. Revelation 20, beginning in verse 11. Revelation 20, beginning, beginning in verse 11. Revelation 20, 11, this is what John observes. Then I saw a great, a great white throne and him who sat on it from the, from, uh, excuse me, let me start over. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose presence heaven and earth fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things are passed away. And he said, and he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of, of the water of life without cost. He who comes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. 
for the cowardly, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and adulterers and idolaters and all liars, they will be, their part will be in the, la in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven plagues came and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now down to verse 22 of chapter 21. I saw no temple in it, in this city. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The, in the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and there will be the glory and the honor of the nations, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of the street. On either side of the street, there was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and they will no longer, there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we get into your word this morning, that you would just open up our eyes to get even the slightest hint of a glimpse of what awaits us. Help us to understand where we stand, where we will stand because of your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So over the past few weeks, we've talked about the tenses of salvation. We've talked about the past tense, which is justification, that we have been declared righteous. We talked about the present tense, sanctification, being made righteous, being transformed into what we have already been declared to be. However, if God is the grand subject of the gospel, then we must realize that although we are the objects of the gospel, the objects of this glorification, in some sense, we are not the only ones that are being glorified. Rather, God is. We understand that glorification best understood realizes that the gospel culminates in the demonstration of God's glory. So at the end of all things, how is the glory of God revealed? I think we see this in several ways. First of all, God is glorified in rendering judgment on the living and the dead. We talk about good news, this doesn't necessarily seem like good news, but it is. Here we see the culmination of all things. The sovereign of the universe is rendering his final verdict. 
The grand subject of the gospel narrative is bringing the story to its close and is wrapping up all of the details. When we read a book, we always, we always want to see how all of these details wrap up. And here we see it taking place. The end begins as the books are open and the deeds of all, living and dead, are revealed and judgment is passed. Note first that this judgment is not just simply for select groups. There is a judgment that, we, that is talked about elsewhere, but this judgment is for everybody who has ever lived, both sinner and saint. Every deed of everyone who has ever lived will be revealed. Because everything that we do, everything that we have done, everything that we will do is being recorded in these books. Jesus says in Matthew, either make the tree good and its fruit's good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruits. Talking to Pharisees, he says, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word people speak, they shall give an accounting for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Now the context here when Jesus is talking about justifying is not our ultimate justification. It's not the being declared right with God. We will be viewed we will be assessed, judged as right, and judged as wrong by our words. Looking back in a few verses, if you look back in this context, Jesus is making a comment about the ultimate rejection of the Holy Spirit. This is the chapter in which Jesus talks about the, sin, the unforgivable sin, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, which I take to under, as being the ultimate rejection of God. If we continue to reject the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, as reflected by our speech, we will stand ultimately condemned. At the end, both sinner and saint will be judged by their deeds. This is the handing out of eternal rewards. So what are those eternal rewards? We see this also in this context. This judgment is both to eternal life and to eternal death. In the midst of all of the books being opened, one book, there's one book that's specifically mentioned and that is the book of life. In this book, we see, not, we see that not only is the judgment for both sinner and saint, but it is also to eternal life and eternal death. I stated several weeks ago that if God is infinite, then any offense against an, in, an infinite God must require an infinite punishment. The punishment must be proportional to the one offended. God being infinite, that punishment, that assessment of judgment must equally be infinite. I also mentioned that as humans, we are only infinite in one way, and that is in terms of time. We are eternal. And I mentioned that the reason Christ could take on the wrath of God, the infinite wrath of God, 
is because Christ is not only infinite in terms of time, but he's infinite in terms of capacity. So at a point in time, he could take on the wrath of God. So for those who reject this provision of faith, who do not confess faith in Christ, who have rejected that, there's only one logical outcome. And that is eternal judgment. John describes in Revelation 21, 8, that this is a place for what he calls the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and, and all liars. This is described as the second death. Death in this so in this case, is not the cessation of existence. We think when someone dies that they cease to exist. That's not the case. Here we see that this is endless, that this is eternal. So this death is eternal separation from the giver of life. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Not only is the judgment to eternal death, but it's also to, to eternal life. Those who are declared righteous by faith have eternal life forever in the presence of the giver of life. I'll expand on that a little bit more here in a bit. The last way we see that God is being glorified by rendering judgment on the living and the dead is that this judgment includes death and Hades. I might also add, if you look back in this immediate context, that it includes Satan and his angels in this judgment. Everything that has been opposed to God, everything that is contrary to the holiness and glory of God is being judged and is cast into the lake of fire. Everything that was wrong will be set right. We do see that God is glorified in another way. One thing that's repeated several times throughout Scripture is the impact of sin on all of creation. We see this right from Genesis chapter 3, where mankind would struggle with creation in order to eke out a living in the soil. We see in Romans 8:19. For the anxious longing of creation eagerly, await, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. However, we also see in the last two chapters of Isaiah, and we also see in 2 Peter 3, the promise of a new heavens and a new earth. We see that once again here in Revelation. In this promise, we come to understand that God is glorified through a renewed creation. And we see this in several ways. First of all, we see that creation will be familiar, but different. John notes that the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there was no longer any sea. Peter observes in 2 Peter 3 that the earth will be destroyed with intense heat and that everything that we see around us will, will cease to exist, will be done away, and will be replaced with new things. Yesterday, Karen and I took a drive. It's one of those is kind of a spontaneous thing. And we went for a walk down at the, at the beaver ponds over here by the park, and then we decided to go for a drive. 
Well, the drive didn't turn out to be much because as you recall yesterday, it was not exactly uh, the most conducive for viewing. So we had driven up through some of the hills, some of the back roads, and it was some thick fog going up over the hills. And eventually we made our way to my in-laws house. We surprised him, showed up there. It's the first time I'd been there since the fires. And during that time, my father-in-law had replaced the deck on the back of his house. And so I wanted to see this new deck. One of the things that was amazing was I walked out there and this, look, this deck looked strikingly familiar. It was the exact same design as the old deck. It had railings, it, had, it was the same height off the back, off the second story, and the stairs into the backyard followed the exact same path as the stairs from the previous deck. He had completely replaced this deck, brand new deck that was more durable, more enduring because the old, the old one was rotting away. So it is with this new heavens and the new earth. It's going to be familiar but different. There are going to be things that we are going to recognize but it is going to be a universe that no longer is corrupted and, de and decaying. God will renew the universe and replace it with one that is familiar but different. We see as well that all that had been corrupted in the new heavens and the new earth will be gone because the curse will be gone. Remember that man struggled by the sweat of his brow, working hard to make a living. Death and sin had corrupted the earth. And Paul reminds us again in Romans 8, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation groans and suffers pains of childbirth together until now. The great longing of creation is to be freed from the curse. And we see in the new heavens, in the new earth, that it is in fact freed from the curse. One more difference will be the absence of the sun and the moon. Now, during the winter, times here, we kind of know what it's like to live without a sun or a moon. But this will be for an altogether different reason. In its original creation on the fourth day, we saw in Genesis chapter one, that the sun was created to govern the day and the moon to govern the night. So why will the sun and the moon no longer exist? because creation will be filled with God's glory. We already see a glimpse of that in Psalm 19, where David writes that the heavens are telling of the glory of God. However, this will be much different from that. God's glory will shine forth in a very literal way this new city in which we will dwell will be lit by God's glory and its lamp, John observes, is the lamb. The same glory that caused Isaiah to fall on his face, calling curses upon himself, will now be 
the welcoming and illuminating light in this new holy city. No need to fear, no need to stumble because the glory of God will be the light of our eternal home. Rather than revealing the wretched nature of the sinner, God's reveal the righteousness of the newly redeemed. You see, God is not only glorified in rendering judgment on the living and the dead, and not only is God glorified in renewing creation, but God is also glorified in redeeming and restoring his people. And if 2020 has reminded us of anything, it's reminded us that we live in a world that's filled with pain and suffering. For me, the year began in January with a missile attack in Iraq that brought, excuse me, that brought the US to the brink of war with Iran. Shortly thereafter, we had the start of this global pandemic. We've heard stories of hospitals filling up. Early on, we saw a high death count in the Northeast. People contracting the COVID virus in various degrees Regardless of our perspective on the response, we all have witnessed businesses close and lives unalterably impacted by this disease. Add to, add to this those who are suffering in other ways, conflicts and relationships, the devastation of wildfires, the stress of the election, and on and on it goes. Sometimes we wonder if this will ever end. It seems to go on interminably. We wonder, where's this all leading? And this is all leading here. For the redeemed, we have something better in store for us. When God is glorified in redeeming and restoring his people, we are reminded that the redeemed will be free from pain and suffering. I remember when I broke the news of Eleanor's passing. Perhaps the most common response I got was, well, at least she's not cold anymore. And it'll be similar for us. The things that caused us pain, the things that caused us suffering, the things that caused us misery will be gone. We are told that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, the first things have passed away. Imagine what that will be like. Imagine what a glorious day that will be. No suffering, no pain, no conflict, no sorrow. And the tears that we had will be wiped away by God himself. What a thing to look forward to. Not only will, be, will we be freed from pain and suffering, but we will be freed to partake 
in life-giving sustenance. Now, I put, this, I put it this way because really we see two ways in which this takes place. We see two life-giving things present in this new Jerusalem. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In a very real sense, we see both of those desires fulfilled in this new Jerusalem in the holy city. The first one we see in Revelation 22, 1, this is the water of life, which is described as being clear as crystal coming down from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I remember a few times that I would go cut firewood with dad up in the woods. There would be, t there would be times where we were just thirsty. And you get these little streams trickling through the woods. It's, you know, back then you didn't really think about it running it through a water purifier. You didn't bring bottled water with you. You get these springs of water that would be there and just cool, clear, refreshing water. Springs of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. For people who have been parched by sin, but have been redeemed, the very thing we thirst for most is the most life-giving. When Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four, he describes to her a source of water that she knew nothing about. The water that Jesus described was living water. The eternal city will flow with an endless supply of eternal life-giving water. The thing we thirst for the most will be satisfied coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In verse two we see, of chapter 22, we see the tree of life bearing 12, 12 kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree will be for the healing of the nations. Now if you recall back in Genesis, Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter three, the tree of life was present. Now, initially, before they had disobeyed God, Adam and Eve had the opportunity to partake in the tree of life. But by one act, taking part, partaking of the one tree that was forbidden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God stepped in and through the cherubim blocked the the approaches to the tree of life. Humanity no longer had access to its life-giving fruit. Yet, here in the new city, once again, we see the tree of life. We have the opportunity to access its healing and sustaining properties in the holy city. What humanity had been driven away from, the redeemed are now invited to partake of. What, we, what had been present from the beginning is now restored. We will eat and drink, not because we need to, but because we desire to, and it is a desire that has been redeemed as well. All the things that we hungered and thirsted for in this life, the righteous things of God will be satisfied in the most complete and glorious way because the redeemed will be freed to partake of its life-giving sustenance. 
Finally, we see that the redeemed will be freed into the presence of God. Throughout these three chapters, we see that God is renewing and restoring everything. Everything that has been corrupted by sin, God is renewing. All of this is taking place so that those who had been redeemed might once again be able to be in fellowship with him in his very presence. So when we come together to worship, we come together in a place like this. We come together in churches, in cathedrals, in chapels. Imagine, however, a city where there wasn't such a place. Imagine a community in which there was no place to gather for the purpose of corporate community worship. No central location, no physical building where people would gather. Now, at a minimum, we'd probably think, oh, that's odd. You can go just about anywhere in the world and find some place of worship of some type. At worst, we would think that this is tragic. No house of worship, and yet we see in the eternal city, in the new Jerusalem, that no such building exists. There is no temple. Why? Because there is no need. Revelation 21.3 says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And then in 22 verses three and four, we see that the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his bondservants will serve him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. I could talk about that last phrase a little bit, but I'll defer that for another time. All throughout scripture, we are reminded that no one can see the face of God and live. Right now, if any of us as we are right now, we're to see the face of God. We could not. We could not see the face of God and live. However, in this new Jerusalem, we now see that God will dwell among men and the redeemed will see his face. What will that be like? Have you ever wondered? Have you ever spent time wondering what it would be like to see the face of God? I think the closest that I could come to is, I don't know if you've seen videos online of people who have been colorblind and they have these special glasses that they make. I remember seeing one and I, I believe the guy was a, a military veteran. He was retired, spent his life in a variety of occupations, but his adult children got him a pair of these glasses. And the video shows him putting them on and stepping outside. And for the very first time, he got to see the American flag in its full color. And he started crying. Take that emotion and magnify it exponentially. The God that we've never seen, the God that we were not allowed to see, the God that we could not see because sin is present in us, is now present among us in his full glory, and we will be able to look on his face 
unveiled. The thing that we desire the most, our deepest longing of our hearts, corrupted as they have been by sin, yet redeemed. The deepest cry of our hearts, the deepest relationship for which we were created. We now see fulfilled. Not with the glimpse of the backside of God as Moses experienced, but rather the full unveiled eternal view of the face of God. All barriers have been removed. All obstacles broken down. No more hindrances remain. We shall behold him. The end of mankind, the goal of mankind, is the glory of God. In, exp in experiencing the glory of God for all of eternity, we will discover that we have need of nothing else. For the last eight weeks, we've been on a journey together seeking to understand what the, gospel, what the scriptures have to say about the gospel. As we have learned together, the gospel is woven through every page of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it begins with God creating everything good. The crowning achievement of his creation is humanity. Created in the image of God for fellowship with him and for intimacy with one another. God in his sovereignty provided man with an opportunity to demonstrate his obedience. However, through the deception of the serpent, mankind chose to disobey. So mankind fell under the curse of death as God's punishment for their sin. In the midst of this, God provided for the redemption of humanity through the promise of a seed who would deal a death blow to the serpent and who would redeem humanity. We saw as well that God's holiness magnifies man's awareness of sin, yet God in his grace provides an unlikely savior. Jesus Christ, God the Son, who would die in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that in his death we might be made alive. Those who call upon him in faith, we learned, are declared to be just, not on the basis of deeds that we have done. We must acknowledge what God already knows, that we are sinners, rightly deserving of judgment. We then, by faith, receive Christ's righteousness on the basis and on that basis, we are declared to be just. Having been justified, we begin this process of transformation into what we have already been declared to be, the process we call sanctification. Here we experience a renewal because the Holy Spirit has been poured out into our hearts and we are able to call out to cry out, Abba, Father. This process, like our justification, is the work of God in us as we learn to walk in the Spirit. It is not about us, but it is about God in us. Finally, we have seen that this process will be completed when we stand with all the redeemed in the new heavens, in the new earth. We will enter a new city an eternal city where God reigns and where all the barriers to dwelling once again in the very presence of God have been, remo have been removed. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. And the gospel culminates in the glory of God. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news. We thank you for this gospel. We thank you that you have communicated it to us so richly and so profoundly in the words of scripture. We thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who calls us to your own glory and goodness. We thank you that we have need of nothing more. We thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, I pray that we would spend time in your word, that we would chew on your word, that we would get into your word, and that your word would get into us. Help us to understand this foundation of truth and help us to understand the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you would work in us to transform us into who we've already been declared to be. I pray that we would live out lives that have been transformed by the gospel in the presence of those who are watching us. I pray that you would give us a hope and that you would give us the ability to respond to the reason for that hope with gentleness and reverence. Lord, I pray that this gospel would not just remain in this room, but that it would go from here into our neighborhoods, into our community, into our state, our country, and our world, that we would see lives transformed and that we would stand for righteousness, that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, I pray that whatever the future holds in this life, that we would have a confidence of knowing whose we are and where our home truly is. Thank you for the good news of the gospel and for your scriptures that, let us, that lets us know what it is in truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.